Awesome to have you guys here this morning. Uh, My name is Tony. I have the privilege of being here on staff at Wellspring. Uh, If you're new or visiting, we're glad you're here. Welcome. Uh, If you are a kid and want to hang out with some other kids, uh, we got a couple little uh, teachers back there, teams and teachers. I think we got a fourth and fifth grade classroom, and then we got another line. Is that Jim? Is Jim with fourth and fifth? There we go. Jim's with fourth and fifth. Jeannie is with everyone else, I guess. So go to her. Have fun. All right. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to continue in our series called uh, Messy Church, Merciful God, Uh, right? Because church life is never super simple. uh, And when we dig into Corinth, we're going to see that life was not super simple in the church 2,000 years ago, and it's not super simple and easy today either. Last week, we started going through 1 Corinthians. We did the introductory part of the letter. Now we're going to dive into the body of it. And what we're going to realize is Paul is going to talk about one thing in particular. He's going to talk about this idea of unity and its sort of really nasty flip side, division. Now, as modern people, we recognize division, right? We live in an incredibly polarized, divided world, right? We think of this, just all the stuff going on politically right now and all the division happening. And we see this in the church. The truth is, before we did a replant here, right, two and a half years ago, uh, there was a fair amount of division in this place. The church was called Mayflower at the time, right? And there was division, not just over like carpet colors or paint on the wall, uh, not a bunch of things that even were central ethical things. But it was often about worship, And particularly, like, what instruments do you play, right? What songs are the best songs to sing to worship God? And as I look back on that season, as I hear stories in this place, I just realize as human beings, we are capable of taking incredibly holy, incredibly profound things and twisting them according to our preferences and losing sight of God's preference in the midst of it. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at Paul's words to the Corinthians. This is how he says it in verse 10 and 11. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Now, as we begin, right, last week we talked about how Paul is following a basic rhetorical discourse and going, you know, he introduces himself, then he introduces his audience, and then he talks, he does this little thank you thing where he's trying to build some appeal, some sense of like warmth with his audience. This is called the proposito. It's kind of like the ancient equivalent to a thesis in a letter. That's what verse 10 is. Verse 10 is Paul saying, hey, this is the big deal. And he doesn't say, hey, I say this to you in my name. In the name of Paul, the founder of this church, he says it in whose name, right? In Jesus' name. Now, in the original language, it says brothers. uh, But contextually, we know this is for the whole church, right? It would have been read Like this, right? There would have been a gathered community and they would have read this letter out loud to the men and the women, right? To the the children, the teenagers that were there. Verse 10 gets into three distinct appeals that Paul makes, right? He says, I appeal to you. The first appeal is that they all agree, right? We see this in the text, right? That all of you agree. That's his first appeal, Now, we have to be careful to think, sometimes we think of like the absence of conflict is unity, but that's that's not what's going on here, right? Actually, agreement means that they have some basic stuff that they agree on. This isn't, I avoid that person so that I never talk to them, right? So we're good because we never talk, right? That's not what Paul is getting at. There's a basic level of agreement in this body, right? They're sort of on the same page, but this isn't they're robots, right? In, verse, in chapter 12, we'll get into this diversity unity thing. There's this level of agreement they have together. And then Paul says this, right? He says, second, he appeals that there be no divisions, right? In the text, right? He says, right? There will be no divisions among you. Now, this is an important word, this word division. 
So this is where we get, it comes from the Greek word schismata, where we get the word schism. But it has a really interesting historical context. So if you look back into Mark 1-2, what you'll see is that there's these fishermen. And what happens is their nets have ripped. Their nets have schismed. So what this implies is that there is an original unity. And based on that original unity, there's been a tear or a divide. So what Paul is saying is, hey, when I was there with you, when I was there for 18 months and then I left, right? Three or four years ago, I haven't been there. But when I left, you guys were not divided. You were a net that I wove together that was on the same page trying to accomplish a similar purpose. Over the last three years, you've had some rips. There shall be no divisions. There shall no, be no rips in the net of your community. Third, he says, you guys should be united. Right? Specifically in the text. But that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now again, this word echoes back. Mark 119. What happens, right? They're mending their nets. They're making their nets united. So now these words are playing off each other, right? So you have division is the ripping of a once unified net, right? United is a net that was once whole that is now breaking. So Paul is doing a play on words here. He's saying, just as when I left you guys, you were united. I want you to be united again of the same mind and of the same judgment. Now, how does Paul know this? In chapter 16, we know that the Corinthians, through three different guys, have sent letters to Paul asking questions like, hey, Paul, can you give us some advice here? As that's happening, there's these people, Chloe's people, right? Now, Chloe, we don't know exactly. A lot of people think she's a businesswoman who has some business holdings in Ephesus, where Paul is, and in Corinth. And she just has regular trade, and every so often she sends some people over there and says, hey, update Paul on what is happening. So Chloe's people say to Paul, man, there's some serious division going on. But the Corinthians don't know that Chloe's people have said this. And which leads then into verses 12 and 13. For what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Right? Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now you might be confused, like, what's Paul doing here? Well, most theologians think, most scholars think that he's actually quoting slogans that the Corinthians used, right? So they're finding their little, like, pockets and parties that they have their allegiances to. One pocket is like, I follow Paul! Right? Another pocket's like, oh no, I follow Apollos. And we'll get into these names in a second. And then there's another party that's like, I follow Christ. And you're like, isn't that the right answer? And yes, and no. Right, if it's used poorly, imagine it like this. Oh, you follow Paul? <laughs> you follow Apollos? <laughs> I follow Christ. You know? Now imagine you're saying basically like, I am the one doing the true thing. You're wrong. I'm the one doing the right thing, right? And when you do it in that way, you're actually just fostering divisiveness. Paul's like, yeah, we can't have this. Now, I want you to imagine this experience. Someone brings this letter in, you're all sitting here, and now you're getting your slogans repeated back to you in a public way. People are like, oh, how did he know that? Does he know what party I'm a part of? Right? He's reading this out loud. Now, Paul also says, right, this word Apollos, or this guy Apollos. There's a little historical context here. I thought... It might be easiest to do a doodle of it. So, what we'll see is in Acts 18, so two weeks ago I think we did this, right? Paul, he does this trip through the Mediterranean world. He kind of goes up this way, over here, and he ends up in Corinth, right? So, that's Paul's second missionary journey. He spends 18 months in Corinth, and then from Corinth he goes to Ephesus, and then he goes down to Caesarea, Okay? While he is here, or going down to Caesarea, there's this guy named Apollos who's in Alexandria. He's raised in Alexandria. Uh, he is super eloquent with the scriptures. 
he goes up north while Paul is going down here and he lands in Ephesus. Now when he's in Ephesus, he runs into Priscilla and Aquila, right? Priscilla and Aquila meet Paul in Corinth, then they go to Ephesus. Paul goes down here and now Apollo shows up, Priscilla and Aquila are here. And they realize this guy, Apollos, who's super eloquent, he knows a lot about the scriptures, he's never heard of Jesus' baptism. He's only heard of John the Baptist's baptism. So they're like, okay, great. John the Baptist, you know, he was in Israel down here, right? He did this awesome thing, but now we baptize people in Jesus' name. He kind of puts the puzzle pieces together. Then the church in Ephesus sends Apollos to Corinth. So what we have, Paul is gone, Apollos comes to Corinth. He's this super eloquent guy. And the text says this in Acts 18. Right? When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing right, by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So he shows up in Corinth and he starts explaining to them, this is who Jesus is and he's this incredible helpful person. And there's no hint in the text <clears throat> that he and Paul are like, you know, at odds. Instead, what happens is the Corinthians, they're like, man, when Paul was here, he said this. Then Apollos comes in, they're like, but now Apollo says this. And then you have this word uh, Cephas, right, which is a Latinized version of the Greek of Kepha, which is Aramaic, which is where we get Peter's name. Right? So Peter's this big person in the other church. People are like, oh, no, no. Okay, I get Peter. Right? And then another person's like, I get Christ. And they're doing just what they did in their culture. Right? So in the culture, in Corinth, you have these sophists, these preachers that would come in. They're all about presentation. They're all about winning arguments. So they come in and then they're like, it's sort of like sports teams today. Where it's like, oh, I'm with Socrates. I'm with Seneca. All right, I'm with that person. They sort of claim their people. And now they're doing the same thing in the church. I get Paul. Oh, how about we be with Paul too, you know? And now they've created this division around personality and teaching. So Paul asks them three questions. He says to them, right, is, is Christ divided? Right, is Christ somehow separated into parts where you can claim him as your own? Obviously the answer is no. Paul asked them, right, did I, did I die for you? Did Paul die for you? Again, right, the obvious answer is no. He's trying to get them to see how they're making idols out of their preferences, out of these leaders, out of their ideas, right? They're making idols out of these things rather than submitting to Jesus' lordship in their life, right? They're more committed to their theological bents than they are to the person of Jesus in their midst. Right? They're losing track of the fact that they got there by grace, by Jesus dying on a cross for them, not because they were somehow amazing theologians. Paul III asked them, were you baptized in my name? Right? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. Right, they're baptized in the name of Jesus. And we know baptism is a sign of allegiance in the first century. One of the ways that you publicly declare in the first century that you are Jesus is, is you get baptized. You say, all right, put me in the water. That's a symbol of me being dying and then raising from the water is me coming to life in whose name? In Jesus' name. Not in Paul's or Apollo's or Peter's. In the name of Jesus. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 3 through 5, Right. Be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called into one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And surely, right, Paul taught this stuff when he was with them. And yet, they're dividing. Now, before we're just sort of, I don't know, I sort of read this and I'm sometimes tempted to be like, what is wrong with these people? You know, like, get their act together. Come on, people, you know? And then I step back and I realize, like, they didn't have a New Testament. You realize that? 
Like you can go back and you're like, let's see what it says in 1 Corinthians, right? They didn't have a 1 Corinthians. They're just getting it read to them aloud. Almost all these people are converts from, uh, from a Gentile worldview. They are not saturated in the Old Testament. They don't have all these parameters. Moreover, almost all of them have known Jesus less than four years, likely less than three. They have no like long-term mentors that are like, hey, let me help you out here. I know for me, when I started following Jesus, I was passionate, but I was like a wrecking ball for those first few years. I did not do the smartest things all the time. They're trying to figure it out. Moreover, their founder has left them. So Paul leaves, Apollos comes, that great, but they're still trying to figure this thing out. And they're not doing a great job of it. Paul continues in verses 14 through 16. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. I love this because it's sort of this feeling of Paul's doing an argument and then he's like, sort of goes into this thing where he's like, well, I did baptize Stephanus. I forgot about him. You know, I love that. But a couple people, right? So Stephanus is one of the early converts. Gaius is one of the people who hosts Paul. So they use his house. He must be a fairly wealthy guy. He uses his whole house to host the Corinthian congregation. Crispus is the head of the synagogue, right? He converts in Acts 18. And then Paul sort of gets back onto his argument in verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now, it's important here to realize that Jesus is not downplaying the role of baptism. He's not saying, uh, who cares? No, no, no. If you are a follower of Jesus and you haven't gotten baptized, you really should. This is a practice that has been practiced through church history. If you haven't gotten baptized, come and talk to me. We're going to do baptisms on Easter. Get baptized. That's a way of publicly declaring your faith in a group of people. It's important. But Paul is saying even more important to his calling is the preaching of the gospel. Why? Well, the preaching of the gospel always precedes baptism. Right? Paul has to go to Corinth, declare the gospel. Say, hey, Jesus is Lord, worship him. And then as a response, what? People get baptized. That's how first century conversion worked. Right? We didn't have multi-generational families in the church, right? It was like everyone was baptized as a response to the gospel in the first century. Now, Paul says he was sent to preach the gospel, which is shorthand of way, saying he's sent to preach the gospel. He is sent by God, right, as an apostle, a sent one, to declare the good news of who Jesus is. What does that mean? Shorthand, he is Lord, he is master, he is king. Now, we know this for a number of historical reasons. So, Augustus Caesar... Caesar at that time, when he would conquer, he's Caesar of the Roman Empire, right? When he would conquer a land, let's say he's in Germany, and there's a barbarian horde, and they have pitch axe, I don't know, what do they have? Who's like a weapons historian? They have some sort of weapon, right? And then the Roman army comes, they defeat them. What, is, what does the army do? What does Caesar do? He stands up, he sends out the good news, the euangelion, same word, he sends the good news of the Pax Romana throughout the whole Roman Empire, saying two things. You are safe. We've killed the barbarians. Two, now you can be economically prosperous because we're going to take all of their minerals and all the raw material. Right? Who benefits? Right? The Roman people. Now, what does the early church do? They appropriate this idea of the good news and say, no, no, no. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is. So Paul goes through the Mediterranean world saying, hey, there's all kinds of things you can worship in Corinth. You can worship your reputation. You can worship these other gods. I'm telling to you, Jesus is Lord and you should worship him alone. So Paul goes out into Corinth. He says, you have to worship Jesus as Lord. Otherwise, what happens, right? The cross is emptied of its power. Now, what does that mean? 
I think this is a contextual illusion. What are they doing? Sophists are going around. They don't care about the actual truth of the gospel. They just want to win arguments. Right? They're all about their own reputations. And Paul's like, I don't care whether you think I am a good preacher. I want Jesus to be elevated as Lord. I don't care whether you guys applaud at the end of my sermon. I want you to commit your lives to the person of Jesus. Because when we put the attention on ourselves, what do we do? We empty the gospel of his power. We make it about ourselves and our preferences. And what happens? God is not at the center. Then God doesn't change us in the world from the inside out. As our hearts are given allegiance to Jesus. That's how Paul kind of ends verse 17. And the question for us today then is, so what does this mean for us? What do we do with this? The first, I think, speaks into church unity. So what we see in this text, right, is Paul left Corinth, things were good. The net was united. Over three years, what happens? There start to be divisions. There start to be tears. Problems start to surface. You know, we happen to be in an awesome season, I think, from a unity perspective in this body right now. But I look back and I realize, like, actually how much hard work got to that place. See, before we did the church plan here, there was some division. And the people that were here made a commitment. There was actually a time when the leaders of the church got up at that upper area of the fellowship hall up there, and the church body was standing on the bottom, and they made a vow and a commitment to God that they would set aside their preferences to see God do a new thing in this place. I, mean, I just want you to enter into how profound that is. You're at your most vulnerable. The church might close. You love, love this place. Many of the people have been here over 20 years. And they get to this place, they're like, you know what? We will do anything to see God work in this place. We will set aside our agendas. We will set aside our preference so that God is glorified. And I think we are standing on the foundation of their worship. We are standing on the foundation of their worship that they would set aside their preferences and focus on the preference of God in this place. Two, from the very beginning, this church has stood on other churches' shoulders. We never did this on our own. One day, Rick Duncan at Carmel Prez was praying and he felt like God nudged him to reach out here. And he reached out and he said, hey, how can I help you guys? One thing leads to another. He fundraises a lot of money so that we can actually do a church plant in this place. During that same time, right? Shoreline over uh, by the airport was like, you know what? We want to help too. And at every step of the way, they have given us resources. They have given us people to advise us, right? Without Shoreline, without Carmel Prez, like we would not be here today because there was a spirit of unity, not just in this church, but in the broader church, God has done a new thing in this place. We are unbelievably dependent on the faithfulness of the few that were here and on the faithfulness of God's body in the peninsula that we exist today and that we are reaping some of the unity that they sowed. But I'm also very aware. I'm very aware, right? After about three years, Paul leaves, things start to unravel, right? We're at two and a half years. <laughs> I'm just praying, right? Year three, it's like, push it back, you know? But what can we do to make sure that the net stays whole? What can we do to not give in to that divisiveness? And there's three things I want to focus on. One is, I think we have to model our future on the people that were here that set aside their preferences. And we need to set aside our preferences if we want to see the unity that God desires in this place. And when I say our preferences, I mean this. It is really easy to fall in love with particular things. Theological bents, 
the way things are done in a particular place, right? As human beings, we love things. We like things. Like, that happens. But it is also very easy for us to start elevating our preferences and stop caring about God's. And this is the initial seeds of division. Does God gift us? Yes. Does God give us wants and desires? Yes. But we need to be careful about elevating our preferences, our wants, versus discerning what God wants in a place. I just invite you today, what are the ways you are tempted to elevate your wants in this place at the risk of unity? Second thing, and this is related, has to do with our wisdom. I think that we tend to really over-elevate our wisdom. N.T. Wright is like this brilliant theologian, written all kinds of books. I mean, just massively educated, right? He says this. He's pretty confident that 20% of what he knows is wrong. Smarter than all of us, way more educated than any of us. Pretty sure that 20% of what he knows is wrong. The problem is he doesn't know what 20% it is. I remember being in, getting my master's degree and even in my doctorate, realizing I'm reading these people that are way smarter than me. Like their books, right? These are smart people, way smarter than me, way more faithful than me. And they fundamentally disagree with one another. And what it helped me to realize, as a, particularly as I came out of my master's degree, was man, like, I need to be really prayerful if I am going to be willing to make waves in a place. Like, I need to know that what I'm making waves about, man, this is super important. Because I think it is easy to take the small things and make them into the big things. When really, like, if you think back to the first century, we've built our education and our theology on 2,000 years of thought. In the first century, right, when Paul is saying this, like there are core things. The lordship of Jesus, Jesus, be God, Jesus as God becomes man. He dies on a cross for us that we can be united to the Father. Like there are core things. We need to keep the core things core. And I think have a little humility when it comes to a lot of the other things. It's one of the reasons, like in this place, we try and sort of adopt the posture of lifelong learners Versus like, you show up today and you got your theology nailed. It's like, ask me any question. I am a catechism. It's like, no, you're not. Most of us don't know something. It's one of the reasons like Aaron does these super in-depth classes about really controversial topics. Right, we had one on sexuality. Right, one now, he's hosting one on heaven, hell, and earth. Because we want to create an environment where we don't just presume we know everything, especially about really difficult topics. And we create an environment where we can learn together, right? Because the monologue from the stage is not the best way, generally, to enter into super hard topics. We want to create an environment where we can learn together, where we can be wrong together. Does this mean there aren't things that we would fight and die for? No, there are clearly things that Christians through the centuries have fought, given their lives for. Yeah, we should too. Rarely is that the thing that leads to division in a church. The things that we are willing to die for are the things usually that unite us. The last thing is just our partnerships. And I think this is more of a, probably more of a staff commitment and a leader commitment than it is sort of, you know, all of your commitments, but it's one of mine. It's not like we will not adopt a posture of competitiveness with other churches and with other nonprofits and ministries in the area. That we will partner as much as we can with the deepest conviction that Jesus does not love Wellspring more than any other church on this street or in the city or in this peninsula. That God loves us all. And we are trying to faithfully serve him from our location. So this week, right, there's a church planter who's an Anglican who wants to do a church plant in Monterey. We met with him. There's another guy in Salinas, right? We are constantly meeting with people trying to share our resources. InterVarsity has staff 
place here, right? They do retreats here. Navigators does retreats here. Christian Memorial Tabernacle does a service here. They have office space, right? They're launching a church out of this place. If this Anglican guy wants to try a little space to do a church plant, we'll let him do it. Because we have a deep conviction that we are one under Jesus. No one is above him. No church, no minister, we are all under him. As I was thinking this week just about this idea and unity, God kept bringing me back, kept bringing me back to Jesus' return. What will it be like when Jesus comes back? Do you think we're going to all have our own little tents and do worship our own little way? Do you think, oh, these are the like really reformed people. They should be over in this tent. No, we are united under Jesus. And this is a multicultural picture. This is people from all cultures around the entire world. This is people from all different backgrounds, all different bents, right? Under the core of the gospel that Jesus is Lord. Unity is only really possible when we get to the second point, right? That Jesus is Lord. Now, What this means, though, is we need to really pay attention to our own lives, right? Because if unity is only possible under the lordship of Jesus, under the kingship of Jesus, with our lives submitted to Jesus, then that becomes the core thing of then, how do we work out unity? So we need to pay attention to our own lives. So one of the principles we use here at Wellspring is this idea of centered set. This is the idea, right? Jesus and his kingdom are in the middle, and the question is not whether you're necessarily in or out, but whether you're moving closer. Right? If you're super far away, are you moving closer to him? Are you stuck? I'm not moving. Are you running the other way? Now, for some of you, you've never made Jesus the core and the center of your life. You've never said, Jesus is God. He is the Lord and King of my life. I think this morning is an opportunity for you to say, all right, I've kind of have half foot in for the last year or 10 years, Jesus, I want in. As we walk into worship, you know, in a little bit, I would say to you, like, this isn't complex. You just say to God, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. And when you do that, come and talk to Aaron or myself or one of the staff and we'll help you work out what does it look like to actually apply that in your life. Two, I think some of us have drifted For a bit, we were going towards that cross and then at some point something happened and we're like, whoop. I think some of us need to recommit. The thing about Centered Set, right, is it's not, the highest value is not that you raised your hand at some sort of uh, youth gathering when you were 13, right? The highest value is to continue to commit your life, orient your life around Jesus. So I'd ask you today, have you sort of gone off course? And if you have, Right? You can recommit your life. Make Jesus the center. Now, all of us, I invite you to just even think about it. Like, we're rarely like, if you imagine sort of each human being as like a circle, right? We're very, very like one circle going towards the cross. We're like a constellation of 20. And sometimes what happens is one, of the, one area of our life kind of gets on track, but a lot of our life is still going in the right direction. And I would invite you this morning just to pay, like, what are the outliers in your life? What parts of your life are not submitted to the Lordship of Jesus? It's your marriage, your relationships, your singleness. What about your work, your studies, your savings account, your income, your hobbies? And when one area of our life is not submitted to Jesus as running rogue, eventually it is going to affect other parts of our life. Jesus invites him to be Lord. Why? Jesus is the one who saves us. Jesus is the one who redeems us. And this is why, with so much regularity, right, we celebrate communion together. I invite the worship team up, and if you're celebrating, if you're helping with communion, you can go over there. 
And we celebrate communion to remember that Jesus and his grace are the center of all that we do. On the night uh, Jesus was betrayed, before he was crucified, he met with his friends and he grabbed a, a loaf of bread and he gave thanks for it and he said to them, this is my body that will be broken for you. Take it and eat it. And he grabbed some wine at the table and he grabbed it and he said, thank you, God. So this wine will be a symbol of your forgiveness, right? That my blood will flow for you that you might be covered in my grace. And this morning as we enter worship, Jesus invites us to commit ourselves around the table of his presence. He invites us, whether we've ever committed ourselves to him and his gospel, to choose him. And we choose him by coming up here and grabbing this bread and dunking it in the wine and say, yes, Lord, I want you. If you're not sure you're there, if you want to come up and get a blessing, you're welcome to. We'll just say a little blessing over your process and your journey. Whether you follow Jesus for 30 years, this is your first day in church, communion is an opportunity for us to resubmit and surrender our lives to him. It's also a picture of the beautiful unity in the church. That we all get up and we're gonna walk down this aisle and we're all saying as a community, Jesus is gonna be the center of this place. And as you stand up, you're setting behind your agendas you're setting behind all the things you're tempted to bring into the church and you're gonna leave them in your pew and you're gonna walk up and say, yes to you, Jesus. And we're gonna do this together. Let me pray for us. God, you are great. You deserve all the honor and the glory and the praise. When we get those windows into heaven, what we see is angels falling flat on their face, singing, holy, holy, holy. God, awaken us to your presence. God, we don't want to play games in this place. We want to worship you. God, we want to worship you. God, convict us. God, may we know you. May we know the power of your presence. May we know the depth of our forgiveness as we partake of this bread and wine. God, we just pray that you would move. God, move among us. Unite us, God. That we pray against all division, that all division would just be confessed and left at the foot of the cross, that we may come up and receive this bread and wine washed and clean and ready, God, for your invitation. Come, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Change us by the power of your presence.